afternoon. Thank you for asking me to come to talk to you. Um, so I think we're going on an hour, Claire. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, that's right, correct. On hour, yes. Yeah, right. Fine. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, what the uh, I, I guess some work around the, the evidence about what uh, what we know. Uh, about how best to address educational disadvantage uh, and make the best use of, uh, of, of pupil premium, but also you know to, to some learning from uh, best practice of working with over sort of 650 schools across the country uh, to and what's working well, what isn't working uh, so, so well to where some of the challenges have been. What I want this session to be though is, uh, I want to, and I said to Claire about this a little bit earlier, to make sure it answers your questions too, so if I'm not answering the things that you want me to, or not saying about the things that you want me to, please, please shout. You know, we've got a small group, so I don't mind being, you know, don't hesitate to interrupt or come in. And also, you might want to bring to life some of the things that, that, that we're talking about as well. Um, look, I, I, I'll, I'll start this off by saying uh, addressing educational disadvantage is hard. It's challenging, you know, and... Uh, um, it just got more challenging, didn't it? Very few people had a global pandemic in their implementation uh, plans uh, around this agenda. And, and actually COVID has, has exacerbated existing inequalities that were already in, in, in entrenched in society uh, too. So what we've seen is that those you know, from the poorest backgrounds would have been disproportionately impacted. Yeah, yeah, and on, 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 on numerous levels. And, but at the same time, I, I want to argue, I mean, I guess that, that's the gloomy bit out of the way, really. I want to argue that we're not powerless on this agenda either, um, particularly if we focus on what's in our gift and what's in our influence. And that is uh, primarily uh, the quality of the learning experience uh, and, of, of course, you know, that sort of broader pastoral uh, care that our, that, that our disadvantaged pupils have in our schools day in, day out, week in, uh, week out, uh, term in, uh, term out, year in, year out. It's not big, sh you know, big interventions that make the difference for our, our, our disadvantaged pupils. It's every little interaction they experience, you know, throughout their school uh, careers goes into uh, addressing uh, th 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 this, this issue. Um, before I do, I, I, I sort of launch into to this. I, just, I, I want to say a sort of couple of things, I guess, about about pupil premium. Um, I, I, firstly, pupils are not at risk of underachievement uh, uh, because they're pupil premium, or indeed any other label they come with. They're at risk of underachievement because of the impact of disadvantage on their learning, um, which is a process, not an event. In many ways, it's something that starts prenatal. Uh, it's a long-term issue, uh, which warrants a long-term uh, response uh, to it. And the best levers for addressing that, for mitigating the impact of disadvantage on, on, on learning, is high-quality, inclusive uh, teaching, uh, teaching and learning. Um, pupil premium as a policy hasn't always worked as well as we'd have liked it uh, to have as a, a, as a policy, partly because uh, sometimes we've intervened to the label pupil premium rather than more broadly how does disadvantage impact on pupils learning uh, and, and, and and so we then have a label-led strategy rather than a learning-led strategy and work we're doing with DFE at the moment around pupil premium use and accountability it, it really looks to move away from the language of what are the barriers to learning for our pupil premium students to how does disadvantage uh, impact on our pupils' learning? So we move from a label-led approach to a learning-led uh, led, led approach. Um, secondly, sometimes accountability has driven our practices rather than the needs of pupils. So we've done things that are short-term and easier to evidence that we've done them uh, rather than uh, the things that we know in the long term uh, will make a difference to pupils' uh, outcomes. And I'll talk through those things in a bit more detail. Um, so. I'm going to draw on a range of research evidence through the talk, but I guess I'm going to cite two particular pub publications, recent publications have been involved in. It's a bit Gilderoy Lockhart, this, isn't it? So for, 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 forgive me, but um, yeah, particularly the Essex uh, work that we did, which was really rooted in trying to codify an approach to addressing disadvantage in schools. You know, what are the underlying principles that we see in schools that are really effective? 
at, a, at addressing disadvantage and to be hearing you know I, I think why that uh, that publication has been relatively well received is that it hears the voices of school leaders of teachers of middle leaders of pupils and uh, 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 rather than it being you know a sort of dry a sort of research uh, manual that just sits on a shelf it really tries to tell the story of you know of, of schools and the challenges they face around this agenda I also want to draw on this opportunity area a study that was involved in a couple of years ago as, a, a, as well. And that's a really important, I think, piece of work because what we found um, was uh, there was very little difference in schools that were performing well by their disadvantaged pupils compared to those that were struggling in those so the opportunity areas you know those social mobility cold spots across the country you know um so there was very little difference between schools that were performing well by the disadvantaged pupils compared to those uh, that were struggling um in terms of how schools were spending pupil premium or the things that they were undertaking the thing that typified uh, schools that were struggling were um multiple head teachers over a short uh, space of time you know, and 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 leadership of pupil premium leadership of disadvantage strategies being passed around school like the baton you know in the 100 meter relay race and sometimes that baton uh, getting dropped and so it wasn't the the types of activities that were problematic but it was about the implementation of those uh, activities and trying to do too many things uh, at, at, at once um, and, and leadership of the pupil premium pass around school like pass the parcel uh, and an infant party and sometimes that getting dropped and also uh, and, and then we saw a sort of culture of sort of initiative fatigue in those schools and, 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 and a cynicism around addressing disadvantage too. So I would argue strongly that schools that are really effective at addressing disadvantage um, have a collective understanding across the school about um, the school's approach to addressing disadvantage is a collective understanding about how disadvantage impacts on pupils learning and how we're responding to it and individuals within that school community understand their role uh, with, within it so we uh, uh, so, so i'd like to suggest that schools that are most effective at addressing disadvantage give teachers and support staff the capacity the professional development, the professional knowledge, uh, the expertise to meet the needs of their pupils in their school co community and context is particularly important uh, here. Um, so in, in, in the red uh, sort of Essex uh, book, we make these sort of eight, uh, eight, eight recommendations, which I'm not going to read uh, to, to, to you, you can all read. Um, but I'll try and talk through, I might, I might not get through them all, but I've got uh, uh, there's some content on the slides as well, which uh, uh, you know I'll sh we can share with you after this and hopefully they're useful as, as, as a takeaway. But in terms of it, culture, values, expectations, security of relationships through to a rigorous impact evaluation framework, and that our strategies need to be bookended by or informed by uh, research evidence, um, but also that sort of system-wide support, which of today is part of it, isn't it? You know, what our sort of partnership working and sort of being outward facing. Um, I know you, Claire, sent me an email saying about, to say a little bit about research evidence, um, you know, and, and, and DFE requirements in the new conditions of grant. So I'll touch on that now. So research evidence, um, can't tell us what we should or shouldn't do. Um, classrooms, People are far too complex uh, for that, aren't they? But it can inform our decision making and point us towards some best bets uh, around where we might channel our, our energies. And I think in terms of addressing disadvantage, what's important that we think about is effect sizes. So what I mean by uh, effect sizes are, what, what are the things that are gonna make the biggest difference uh, to the learning of our disadvantaged uh, pupils? And what I'd argue is that um, the effect size of really, really high quality reading instruction is, is bigger than um, perhaps issues that we have less control over like uh, parental involvement strategies. That's not to say that we shouldn't try and influence the latter, uh, but the effect size of getting it right in terms of the teaching of reading will have a bigger effect for less, you know, for, for perhaps even less effort than uh, chasing the wind around parental involvement uh, strategies uh, too. But um, research evidence suffers from two biases, uh, confirmation bias 
So we look for the research evidence to justify an approach rather than challenge our, our thinking and also publication bias. So studies that show positive effect sizes are far more likely to be published uh, than those that have uh, negative effect sizes. Health suffers from the same. Um, you'll rarely get, you know, um, you know, if, if um, so, for example, Lego funded a study a couple of years ago, uh, say, and, and the findings were that children who played more um, did better in terms of educational outcomes than those that didn't. Now, I'm not disputing uh, the rigor of that uh, of that study, but in terms of publication bias, I suspect um, Lego wouldn't have published that uh, report with a fanfare and a press release if it hadn't shown that type of effect uh, size. But ultimately, research evidence needs to be used to inform our decision making, not to justify it. If we use it to justify decision making, we'll find the evidence to support it. Um, uh, but we need to be looking more, you know, I, I guess more critically at research around any approach that we want to take. In terms of D DFE requirements, what we're, what we're looking for really is, um, if you've adopted an approach to address disadvantage, are you using research evidence to challenge whether that's the right approach is there a strong evidence base behind it? And therefore, is that a best bet in terms of how uh, we might uh, might address uh, disadvantage? So, for example, um, there's strong evidence around embedding formative assessment, there's strong evidence uh, around oral language strategies, there's strong evidence around metacognition, self-regulated uh, learning, there's uh, strong evidence around the, you know, the Nuffield early language intervention, there's less strong evidence around things like mentoring and uh, raising aspirations uh, strategies. But the key is um, that, that we interrogate the evidence and, and, and use it to inform our approach, not to justify it. Um, anyway, I'm gonna try and talk about these eight recommendations through uh, the, the, the talk. Um, and, and I want to start with uh, high expectations around sort of culture values. And, and expectations. Um, it, it's really important that in our own schools we define what we mean by high expectations. Um, it's difficult, isn't it, to imagine going into any school and uh, colleagues saying, well, we've got low expectations of our disadvantaged pupils. Um, it's not for me to define what uh, high expectations are, but we need to have clarity uh, and, and a shared language around what uh, what those expectations are. Um, sometimes those lower expectations can be you know, subconscious or, or, or indeed un, 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 unconscious. Um, at a school level, I, I, I think there's some important um, questions around curriculum equity. So in our primary schools, but also in our, in our secondary schools, if we're not careful through well-intentioned interventions, um, our pupils with the least broad vistas beyond school can get the narrowest entitlement uh, curriculum entitlement in the school and our children with the broadest vistas beyond school get the broadest curriculum whilst our you know perhaps our disadvantaged pupils end up in a bit of a hamster wheel of interventions that's not to say interventions have don't have their place because actually our strategies for addressing disadvantages stand or fall on how well we teach children to read but We've got to be careful because, you know, in, in, in lots of conversations, you know, talk to school leaders around uh, you know, challenges around dress, addressing disadvantage, and they'll talk about, you know, narrow experiences beyond school. If the experience for our disadvantaged pupils, particularly those lower attainers, uh, is narrow in school, then we risk doubly disadvantaging uh, our, our, our pupils. Also, you know, and perhaps more of a secondary issue than a, than a primary one to be thinking about, you know, who is teaching our disadvantaged uh, pupils. We know from a number of studies, recent, most recently the OECD uh, study, that uh, pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds who are lower prior attainers are um, more likely to be taught by non-subject specialists, um, you know, unqualified uh, members of staff, um, and, and, and again, then we have the Matthew effect going on in our classrooms, the rich getting richer and the, and, 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 and the poor getting poorer. So I'd argue that one measure of high expectations is that our disadvantaged pupils have at least equitable access to high quality, expert, well-trained uh, teachers. Um, at a more micro uh, le level, um, a, 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 about 
about experiences in the classroom, really. Um, achievement in challenging learning leads to motivation. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you know, and, and, and how we include all children you know, in challenging learning is fundamental to addressing disadvantage. Using you know, scaffolding, modeling work, for example, scaffolding up rather than differentiating down and giving uh, disadvantaged pupils easier or less work because of their prior attainment or their prior uh, learning, you know, it sets limits uh, on what pupils uh, can, can achieve. Um, and it, re it really, really matters this. We're doing some work in Cumbria in the sort of Western Lakes a couple of years ago, and uh, schools having real challenges recruiting and retaining uh, high quality maths and science teachers in the secondary phase. You know, and, and so you know, disadvantaged pupils in lower sets particularly, their experience was a, you know, a diet of um, supply teachers, high turnover of staff and inconsistent relationships for those that needed the most secure uh, re re relationships. I'm not knocking supply teachers here, by the way. It's one of the most challenging jobs in the in the world, uh, I, 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 I think. Um, but the lack of subject knowledge made things like feedback more difficult, made disciplinary literacy more, 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 more difficult, that inconsistency of expectation and relationships. Some of the pupils from more affluent backgrounds were able to backfill um, through uh, private tuition, those kinds of things, where there was a reliance on supply, whereas those from less affluent backgrounds not able to do that. Um, so, so again, how a, a really good example of where we're struggling to recruit and retain staff that disproportionately impacts on our disadvantaged uh, pupils. I'd also just want to say, just pretty briefly, around expectations. We need to lose the language of low ability students. You know, um, Professor Steve Higgins, Durham University argues that when we label children you know, in, in, in that way, you know, we set limits on what those pupils uh, can achieve. You know, we might say, oh, it's Mark. You know, Mark really doesn't read very much at home. You know, he, he's, he's low ability and over a child's school career, we just expect a little bit less of them. You know, uh, uh, unconsciously, you know, sort of to, um, to contribute a little bit less in conversations. You know, in talk, in, 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 in writing, and those labels, which are pretty meaningless, re re really, we're talking about prior attainment, uh, based on prior experiences, um, they can set limits on what pupils uh, can achieve. Around high expectations, I think one of the most practical things that we can do when we go back to school is to be thinking, you know, who, who is talking in our classrooms? You know, is it the pupils you know, with the most background knowledge who are most secure, uh, who are most articulate, who are most confident doing all the talking, and those who have less well-developed oral language, who are less confident on the margins of discussions. The pupils who need to talk the most are often talking uh, the, 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 the least, and their around sort of equality of opportunity can be really, really powerful. Okay. Um, so, to, to address educational disadvantage, we need to be expert in our pupils. Um, this is a quote from my colleague Margaret Mulholland at Askell, who's a, an inclusion specialist there. Um, he's one of my education heroes, uh, to, to, too. And, and what I'm talking about here is I think we've, we've got to put the pupil premium monster uh, back, in its, uh, back in its box. Um, and, and again, this point around being, uh, being expert in our pupils and, and, and that pupil need, not labels, needs to drive our approach. Assessment, not assumptions, needs to drive our strategy around uh, addressing disadvantage. And, and, and this key question that we need to ask ourselves, what are the controllable factors that impact on the learning of our disadvantaged uh, pupils? Focus relentlessly on what's, what's in our gift. I think you know, assessment, not assumptions about pupils, is, is fundamentally important. But getting this right is critical because poorly identified pupil need leads to poorly identified sort of activity, despite our best efforts, leads to weaker outcomes for our disadvantaged pupils because the activity is not matched to, to, to need. And and, and, and we end up with what I call the supermarket sweep approach to disadvantage, that we're trying to grab hold of interventions and hoping that one of them will work. Often uh, overly focusing on upper key stage two or upper key stage four, chucking the kitchen sink at year six and, and 11 and hoping that something will stick rather than some really, really targeted 
early intervention work uh, addressing pupil need. The earlier that we intervene and the more targeted um, our strategies are at pupil need, the better we give our disadvantaged pupils a chance to thrive and really enjoy uh, their time at school. And I know you might think it's a bit soppy, but I think all pupils um, should have the opportunity to really enjoy and thrive uh, in, in, in school. So what we need is a pupil-led strategy rather than a provision-led strategy that's already been uh, sort of determined. So using um, diagnostic uh, assessment, academic and pastoral, uh, to understand the needs of our pupils. Um, teacher voice, teacher agency is fundamental to a a, a, a more effective disadvantage uh, strategy, listening to pupils about their learning and their learning behaviours um, and knowledge of the community uh, that, 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 we're, that we're serving and also to be thinking about subject specific uh, you know, um, issues that where disadvantage might impact as well. So middle leaders are, are, are key to making a, a strategy really, really sing. Once we've addressed um, how disadvantage impacts on learning, we start to think about how we address it through teaching and learning, through academic intervention, those wider approaches, the EF's tiered model. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to talk really briefly about COVID. I won't talk about it for, 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 for long, but I, I, I promise, and I'm not going to talk about hand sanitizers or one-way systems. I, re I really, really commend to you the, the Impact Ed re re report by Owen Carter and his and his colleagues. Um, really interesting longitudinal study looking at the experiences uh, of all pupils uh, during the partial school closures. Um, really interestingly, Owen's team found uh, the least surprising thing that you'll hear this year, uh, that disadvantaged pupils and those with special educational needs found some of the greatest challenges with lockdown. Um, but those challenges were not um, mainly associated with a lack of ICT. That's not to say that some pupils didn't experience some challenges around that, but actually the greatest challenges were around space and environmental issues and, and the lack of a quiet place uh, to, to, to work. Now, again, we can't solve all of society's problems, but it's about thinking, how do we respond uh, to, to, to those things? The other things cited in Owen's uh, re report, um, and, and I'll send this to, to you via Claire's, I think it's a really useful report, is that the main other issues cited as challenges uh, for pupils were a lack of social interaction. Social isolation actually is one of the greatest challenges for our disadvantaged pupils, or along with language, I'll talk about that in a minute. The importance of relationships with teachers and peers. The lack of structure and routine, consistency of expectations, opportunities for conversations and discussions. And in a sort of quite odd way, I guess I find those things quite exciting because they tell us that school matters, doesn't it? School matters for all of our pupils, but it particularly matters for our disadvantaged pupils. What we do really, really matters. We can't solve all of society's problems, but 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 school really, really matters for our disadvantaged uh, pupils. Anyway, in in in, in response to the, the the COVID issue, and there's been a lot of sort of hyperbole and you know a disaster language around uh, this, hasn't there? Sort of catastrophizing, and uh, 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 which is really really problematic. You know, Education Policy Institute, it's going to take 500 years to close the gap, those kinds of uh, things, DFE, ten, uh, EF, 10 years of lost l learning, all of those kinds of things. Because the, And the reason they're problematic, it's not to say that we should hide away from the, those types of studies, but they're not particularly useful uh, uh, for me in the classroom the next day. <laughs> what kinds of things do I need to do? And we'll address this macro issue of the attainment gap and the issues around COVID, not uh, through focusing on the macro, but focusing on the micro of our disadvantaged pupils' experiences in, in all aspects of school life. So we did some work at Durrington Research School on the South Coast ar ar around this. And uh, I've got a cliche for every season. So you know, we talked about these three R's here around restoration into school life, so around clear boundaries and expectations, structure and routine, building pupils' self-confidence, you know, and their faith in themselves and, and, and their faith in school around coming back together and being part of a, a, a sort of wider, uh, a, you know, a, a wider group. Their faith in themselves as learners as part of a wider group is, is really interesting. And, and, and I think 
disadvantaged people's perceptions of themselves as learners can be a real challenge you know, at, 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 at times. Securing the relationships between adults and pupils, between with your peers, with families too, and then a responsiveness to need again, assessment, not assumptions, you know, and, 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 and primarily a focus on literacy too. Anyway, you might find that blog uh, useful. Uh, it's linked at the bottom. Um, our, our, our strategies to address educational disadvantage will stand or fall on the relationships uh, that we forge. I'd love to have written this, these, these paragraphs in this stu study here. Sadly, they're not uh, my, my, my words, but I'm going to pinch them um, for, 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 for now. Um, I, I think it beautifully articulates why uh, relationships are fundamental to better outcomes for all of our pupils, but particularly those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. You know, and, and, and work we've done with colleagues at DFE, you know, really emphasise that we won't address disadvantage by ratcheting up accountability and telling people what we should or shouldn't do. When we do that, we absolve people of accountability, don't we? Because they can just say, well, DFE told me to do this rather than, um, it, yeah, it, rather than it being my responsibility. So uh, our strategies to address disadvantage will stand or fall you know, on, on, on the quality of the relationships uh, that, that, that we forge. When I talk about relationships, I'm talking about relationships between adults and pupils. I'm talking about relationships between adults and adults, how we work together you know, in, in our schools and doing some work in Surrey around disadvantage at the moment. And the biggest challenge we're seeing really there is in school variation rather than across variation in terms of uh, 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 addressing disadvantage. Relationships in pupils and pupils is of fundamental importance and the importance of social interaction, again, and ultimately we want our disadvantaged pupils to have a better relationship with learning. The most effective strategies around disadvantage look to improve pupils as learners. I'd say that's at the heart of an effective uh, strategy. Um, this is the Education Endowment Foundation teaching and learning toolkit. Um, it's a meta meta analysis. These are sort of, of average effect sizes. So it's a long way from the teaching of chemistry to year nine on a wet, uh, uh, a wet Wednesday, is it Wednesday, um, you know, in, in, in May. But at a strategic level, it really can point us in the right uh, direction. What I'd argue uh, in terms of what we see he here is that the strategies you know, um, that have the biggest impact on pupils are hard to do. They're complex, they're rooted in sort of classroom uh, practice, you know, uh, but they're hard to do well. But perhaps more importantly, they're all about relationships. Feedback, for example, is a highly relational uh, transaction. I'll talk about that in, in, a, in a moment. Metacognition, self-regulation, um, collaborative learning, or language interventions, these things are all about relationships. Those things that have much less of an effect uh, size tend to be about structures. That one with a negative effect size, that's repeating a year. Um, physical environment, performance related pay for me gets people working against each other uh, rather than with, uh, with, with, you know, with, with, with each other. Um, so relationships are, are, are key to addressing disadvantage. We can see feedback here on the biggest effect uh, sizes. Interestingly, most of our, our evidence around feedback comes from PE and sports participation. I don't know if we've got any PE specialists on the core, but what is it about? What is it about feedback in PE that makes it really, really effective? I think that it's that feedback is in the moment. That feedback is highly personal to you. It's almost certainly modelled to you as to how to do it uh, sort of better, and then immediate opportunities to respond uh, to and try, uh, try, try again. Any PE specialist might be cringing at my explanation there, so for, 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 forgive me. But yeah, um, uh, so and it's and of course feedback is always going to be domain uh, uh, subject specific, um, but to be thinking about those key ingredients that make it uh, effective. In all the time that you don't have, I'd really really commend to you that Graham Nuttall's book, The Hidden Lives of Learners, um, he, uh, and, and why relationships are fundamental uh, to, to feedback. Feedback is something that's happening in our classrooms up and down the country, isn't it? Sort of day, day, day in, day out, but it's harder to do uh, than we think. We often see success in feedback through the lens of the person who's given that feedback rather than the person who is receiving it. So um, success in feedback is not that I've delivered the feedback. It's how it's been received uh, that matters. Um, 
and uh, and that's why uh, these two issues I want to talk about uh, really matter. Exemplified by Graham Nuttall in his wonderful, wonderful book. Firstly, my perception of myself as a learner is fundamental to whether I can take on board uh, feedback. So if I have a negative perception of myself as a learner, that might be a subject specific or it might be across the board. I'm far less likely to take on for feedback um, than if I have a positive perception of myself as a learner. So you might see your most confident uh, learners chasing you around school, asking for more and more feedback. Whereas um, we did some work with uh, primary schools in West Sussex, introducing live uh, verbal feedback. And year six teachers talking about being like treading on eggshells with some pupils, so, you know, who are the least uh, the least confident. Um, so, it, and, and with that in mind, feedback, if we're not careful, can become a gap widener rather than something that closes uh, closes the gap. Um, so we need to see feedback through the lens of our disadvantaged pupils. The second part of it is about uh, relationships. So I'm far more likely to uh, take on board uh, feedback from someone I have a good relationship with um, than those that I don't have any kind of relationship with. So just going back to supply again, um, I'm, I'm much more like, likely to take on board feedback from someone who knows me well than I have a good relationship uh, with and someone that I, that I don't that I don't have that strong relationship with. I suspect we can all think about examples of this as adults in in, in our careers, can't we? Where we've had some feedback for someone you don't have the strongest relationship with. That's more difficult to take on board than someone that you have a tight relationship with, I think. Or maybe you're just not as sort of petulant as uh, as me. Um, but um, re relationships and perception of self as a learner are of fundamental importance and, and, and it's why feedback can become a gap widener rather than something that closes the gap if we're not careful. Okay, um, so I'm not doing very well with time here, am I? But anyway, um, look, um, the language gap is the attainment gap um, coupled with issues around uh, social isolation. I'm going to focus on language um, here um, uh, for a, a, a decent chunk of, of the discussions. I could, I could talk to you for hours, uh, but anyway, um, the language gap is the attainment gap, particularly when it's coupled uh, with issues around social isolation, again, ex exacerbated by COVID. Um, this is the seminal study, uh, Low Income and Early Cognitive Development from Wolf Vogel and Washbrook, yet again, picking out this correlation between growing up in uh, you know, the, the, the bottom social kind of quintile, lower levels of language, higher levels of conduct and, high, and, and, and hyperactivity. And of course, we know that language sticks to language. You know, it's like two snowballs at the, at the top of a hill. If you do a, if you, the small one and a large one, so the more language I have, the more language I can a, a, acquire. Whereas at that age, if I've got less language, you know, that, 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 that I, I, I'll pick up language, uh, it'll, take, it'll be more difficult for me to pick up language. So again, we have the Matthew effect sort of in, 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 in action. Um, if we can get this right, we give pretty much everything else that we do in our schools a better, uh, a, a better chance of success. It's really important that we don't rush to vocabulary before we focus on developing pupils' oral language, um, because, you know, or language focus from early years right through to key stage five, you know, is of fundamental importance to addressing uh, disadvantage. And again, I'd say, you know, who is talking in our classrooms? Is it those with the best developed oral language? Is it those you know, on, on the margins who are less uh, co le less confident? What's the quality, you know, of the uh, you know uh, of the opportunities for pupil talk? Are pupils expected to always speak you know, in full sentences? You know, is uh, language modelled back uh, to pupils in an inclusive way? Is the language broken down in an accessible way to enable pupils to have multiple interactions um, with new uh, with new language? It's conversation, not word exposure, uh, that builds up our language, and it needs multiple. Uh, student-friendly interactions with that language for me to develop uh, my vocabulary. There's a brilliant article on the Chartered College website by Isabel Beck um, that's called uh, Deepening Knowledge Through Vocabulary Instruction. And I'd really, really sort of co co commend it to you. Um, our disadvantaged pupils need to be immersed in a tsunami of language, but it needs to be structured, teacher-led, you know, and, and talk rooted in research evidence. And the Beck article is, is, is critical for that. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, for our disadvantaged pupils in our, in our schools is what I call the presumption of language. 
that presumption around sort of background knowledge and language um, when um, you know, in, in, in a lesson, in a sequence of lessons, um, addressing issues around language comprehension is the closest thing that we've got to a golden ticket on, on, on this agenda. And I struggle with language comprehension. My lessons become something to get through rather than participate in. I'm clinging on, I'm, I'm, I'm on the margins of learning. And then we see things like desktop truancy, you know, pupils opting out of the, the, the learning, keeping their heads down and hoping that they will get uh, get get through. But this me, this um, study here, this is the terrible twos, isn't it? Terrible fives, terrible elevens, terrible sixteens. And I remember talking to a pupil um, in secondary school in York, asking uh, her, let's call her Claire, for the purpose of this talk, and 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 said, you know, asked Claire what she did when she struggled with her learning, when she found things difficult. She looked me in the eye and said, uh, I cause an argument and I get myself kicked out. Really clear uh, strategy around, you know, I'm struggling with language. You know, I'll just op 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 opt out. But it's not just the number of words uh, heard uh, in those earlier years that matters, but it's the types of words uh, too. So this is the Hart and Risley study that I'm sure lots of you are, are, are familiar with. And I think we share it with a bit of trepidation. There's a lot of extrapolation in, in, in this study, but I think it's instructive all the same around the types of language pupils uh, here. Um, so what the researchers found is that um, pupils from more affluent backgrounds are more likely to hear words of encouragement and, and praise um, compared to those from the most disadvantaged uh, backgrounds who are more likely to hear words of discouragement. And as they point out, this is not about a lack of love or care, but rather just the restrictive nature of growing up poor and you know, having fewer opportunities, you know, perhaps living in less safe environments. I've been working up in Stoke-on-Trent in the opportunity area there recently and young children saying they can't go to the park because it's not safe. And that's the only open space where they might uh, sort of be able to play. So life you know, growing up in poverty, life through the lens of our disadvantaged families, has to recognise that lives you know, are, are, are more restricted opportunities are fewer. And that may, and I want to emphasise the may, may be why you know, pupils feel uh, less confident about risk taking, trying things out, trying new, th new, new, new things, and indeed shy away from praise you know, sometimes, which is why you know, things like the Royal Horticultural Society stuff that Claire was talking to me about at the beginning can provide that opportunity to try uh, to, to, to try things out yeah, um, yeah, uh, 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 and can be really, really important. Um, I, I talked a little bit earlier about the importance of uh, sort of oral language and, and, and again, to be thinking about who is talking in our classrooms and this model of accountable talk by Lauren Resnick uh, and colleagues might be a helpful model to, to, to help ensure that you know, classroom talk is collaborative but highly structured. Um, the best classroom talk is, is teacher-led, planned for, and provides you know sort of in terms of a group task with individual accountability, uh, and, and 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 making sure that you know the discourse is not dominated with those uh, with the most oral language, but gives uh, sort of equality of opportunity uh, in, in 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 the classroom. Um, builds confidence, builds ideas builds knowledge uh, and what I really really argue is that knowledge leads to motivation uh, uh, and, and, and self-confidence and self-esteem we can do some stuff outside of the classroom on that but actually you know, um, it's by being experts uh, and being knowledgeable that's the best driver uh, you know, of engagement and motivation um, one of the most effective ways that we can overcome uh, the, the, the attainment gap is for pupils to be expert uh, readers. The second least surprising thing uh, that you'll hear this year, that children who read frequently, broadly, deeply, uh, have a better vocabulary than those uh, who, who, who don't uh, read. Um, come to the session for those types of searing insights. Um, but uh, this is the U U University College London Millennium Cohort Study, and, and I think it's really useful to, to, to re research. It's really interesting research. Uh, um, but we need to 
dig deeper around the research evidence too and avoid a superficial engagement with it. It talks here about reading for pleasure. Um, and, and it's why I'd really, really argue that one of the most pivotal points in addressing disadvantage is that transition between um, learning to read and, and, and reading to learn. Um, because I'm, if I struggle with reading, if I struggle with decoding, um, you know, I, I'm unlikely to read for pleasure. You know, it's a real slog for me uh, to the breadth and depth and frequency that I need to to overcome this language gap associated with growing up in 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 in, in lower incomes. So just taking children to the library or talking positively about reading, you know, it, it's it's useful, but it's not enough on its own. I'm much more likely to read for pleasure if I've been taught to read or continue to talk to read really, really well. Uh, we, we tend to enjoy things that we're, that, that we're good at uh, um, than things that we find a real, uh, a real struggle. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's more, it's more likely. So how well we continue to teach children to read is of fundamental importance for addressing uh, di disadvantage. And when we do that, we know um, that pupils can overcome that language gap associated with um, you know, growing up on lower incomes. And, and, and these things coming together as part of a, a package around you know, high quality evidence-based language uh, 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 vocabulary instruction in the classroom, um, reading broadly frequently you know, um, you know, beyond and in, and, and in school, coupled with those sort of relationships. Yeah, and me thinking about the disciplinary literacy uh, de demands on pupils in the classroom all come together, weave together to form an effective strategy for addressing disadvantage. And last point on, on, on this um, it, it, it is around representation. Really, really want to commend to you. Again, in all this time that you don't have, the CLPE <coughs> uh, study, now this is uh, a primary organisation, but it's pertinent to secondary schools too, around this quite extraordinary research, uh, or you might not find it extraordinary at, at, at all, but around, uh, you know, that 7% of children's books published in the last three years uh, feature characters from minority ethnic backgrounds. And that's even before we start to unpick what types of characters are they, whether they are just fleeting <coughs> in their appearance, um, whether they're positive characters, you know, so so the challenge is more than just that 7%. Uh, percent. And, uh, and so our literature spine needs to broaden horizons, but also be representative of the communities uh, that we serve too. And that will help issues around, you know, in, in, engagement with reading uh, too. Okay. Um, I want to talk about metacognition and, 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 and self-regulated learning briefly too, and then I'm just going to um, pick up on the issues of bias, and then uh, and then I'll stop. Um, I, so the natural historians on the call recognise there's a harvest mouse, and there's a sort of tenuous link here. But I'd really, really commend you this study at the bottom around you know, um, children persist less when adults take over. I'm thinking about a teaching assistant practices <coughs> there that we sometimes see what Rob Webster, who's done a lot of the TA research, talks about the snowplow TA that removes any learning challenge for pupils um, before, you know, um, or, or, or in, indeed sometimes engage in task uh, c c completion. Um, and we find you know, conversations with pupils uh, uh, around their learning and particularly what they do when they don't know what to do really really insightful and sometimes despite lots of growth mindset posters on walls and things like that when you ask pupils what they do when they get stuck they'll say I'll put my hand up and I'll wait for the teacher as one pupil in South London said to me a little bit earlier in the year I'll put my hand up and I'll wait for the teacher sometimes you might be waiting a long time and it's quite a good strategy isn't it for uh, um, for desktop truancy and, and, and getting out of your learning so um, our most successful learners um, can plan an approach to learn. They're able to plan, monitor, and evaluate their own uh, learning. And evidence tells us that we can explicitly teach uh, children to be, to, to be able to do that within subject uh, domains. So this isn't generic learning to learn lessons, but when we use metacognitive language uh, in, in, in the classroom, when we use uh, sort of modeling, um, when we break down uh, the learning to make it accessible uh, to, 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 to pupils. <coughs> and I'll give an example. Um, we did some work in a, in a South Gloucestershire school uh, last year, and it was Black History Month. 
and uh, the teacher put a picture of Rosa Parks on the board uh, in the lesson and asked the students, does, any, does anybody know this is? And they put a picture and, 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 and he, uh, a student stood up, let's call her Claire, and just gave the most wonderful uh, three minute biography of Rosa Parks and uh, who she was, why she chose to do what she did, what the legacy of it was, what the impact was. It was just uh, completely brilliant. And, uh, and, you know, uh, and, and um, you know, just uh, uh, a joy to, to, to hear. And at the end of it, the teacher said, you know, thank you, Claire. Now we all know about Rosa Parks. And, 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 and we talked to school leaders after about that, the, the problem with that is that uh, we, we need to not just say to Claire, thank you. Now we all know about Rosa Parks. We need to ask Claire how she knows about uh, Rosa Parks. Because if we don't ask how, those pupils without that background knowledge think Claire is just magically clever. She just knows those uh, things. And I could never uh, be able to do, th do them. Claire's magically clever. Um, um, so what we need to do is ask Claire how she knows those things. And she can say, I read the Rebel Girls book and then I watched a TV documentary about Rosa Parks I was interested and then uh, I talked to a relative who you know, who read something more to me about it and the more I knew the more I wanted to know because I had that background knowledge a great motivator background knowledge the glue that makes learning stick and helps me to feel like I belong uh, in, in, in the classroom um, and, and, and so that, then we learn as the rest of the class that you acquire that knowledge through effort yeah, and, 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 and persistence and my colleague Andrew Brumby, who was with me, talked about, and the way he talked about it was to say, you know, don't just celebrate the harvest, the outcome, but celebrate, you know, the planting, uh, the pruning, um, the weeding, uh, you know, that 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 you know that that, that get us to that uh, answer. That we don't just magically know things, but actually, you know, there's the breaking down that process of learning is a fundamental importance, and that's why. You know, sort of guess what's in my head teaching me really really problematic for disadvantaged pupils that don't know uh, the, the the answers look this is a terrible slide uh, for a presentation but i'm going to sh share it you know uh br br briefly anyway very pertinent around sort of tags <coughs> and those uh, challenges uh, recently it's about bias uh, bias exists in our education uh, system um it's part of a natural human response to things as the wonderful Thinking of Fast and Slow uh, book uh, says. Um, we did some really interesting work um, with uh, teachers in Cornwall, just, you know, um, brief experiments around uh, bias and talked to colleagues about what's the first thing that they think about when you say free school meals, when you say special educational needs, what's the first thing they think about uh, when you say pupil premium and colleagues automatically associated those things with, with, with low attainment. And of course, they are flags for pupils at risk uh, uh, for underachievement, but you've got to be wary that they're not, they don't become uh, the narrative. Um, uh, colleagues in Cornwall also talked about biases around surnames. You know, so I've got another Roland. Uh, his brother was bad, never did any homework, uh, uh, homework those kinds of things. Bias is part of a natural human uh, response to things and the way that we deal with it is to get it out in the open and talk about it. Um, and there are some strategies like blind marking that, 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 we, that we can use, but also it's about our micro interactions in the classroom uh, too. Um, but, and, you know, and, and it presents in lots of different ways, biases around attainment labelling, low ability children, uh, categorisation, send pupil premium, Ethnicity. I heard someone just being described as having a tiger mum uh, quite, quite, quite recently. Uh, gender, girls in maths, you know, um, class, white working class, those kind, kinds of things, families and siblings. But it exists in our schools. You know, issues around assessment, it's well documented. Um, but I'd also really commend to you to look at um, uh, Professor Becky Francis's work of, of the grouping study as a qualitative uh, analysis of grouping pupils in key stage three. Becky's study found um, that on average, pupils of Black Caribbean heritage are set two sets lower than what their current attainment says they uh, should be uh, in, in secondary maths. So it's there. The way we tackle it is to get it out in the open and talk about it and discuss it. Okay, um, last uh, last uh, one, uh, Claire, and then I, I, I will shut up in case people want to ask any, any questions. Working with Margaret Mulholland, I talked a little bit earlier, 
I'll we can share all these slides and there's some other, other hopefully useful stuff on, on, on them as well. Um, because so much of what we've talked about is about inclusion in learning. And we've worked to create this uh, maturity index uh, around in, in, in inclusion um, from you know, an immature system that defers to individual experts and designated staff. Margaret talks about when she was a SENCO in Oxfordshire that she brought in the corridor and people would talk about, oh, Margaret, I've got one of yours, uh, rather than individual ownership, you know, uh, uh, um, um, uh, rather than system-wide knowledge, responsibility and expertise and collective uh, responsibility and ownership of, uh, of vulnerable pupils, um, using diagnostic labels to inform strategic planning rather than knowledge of our pupils as individuals, you know, and, um, and, and seeing labels as an anchor on prior attainment planning for most, and a deficit discourse uh, preconceiving difficulties and difference to a more mature system that recognises difference, that acknowledges bias, that expects to be surprised by pupil potential. That's Margaret's language, sadly not mine. I wish I had those uh, words, you know, uh, but focus on that system-wide knowledge uh, and, 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 and expertise. Um, so hopefully that's a, a useful reflection uh, tool for you in terms of your strategies uh, as, as, uh, as well. Um, what I've also got in here, and I'll stop, I've got some stuff around parental involvement. Um, Professor Jill Main's work at the University of Leeds Again, busting this myth that pupils um, and families from lower income groups have lower aspirations than their more affluent peers. I've looked at this research hundreds of times you know, and um, still find it pretty heartbreaking that you know, um, you know, sometimes priorities have to be sort of else, uh, elsewhere. And again, remembering that as schools, we have very, very little, you know, we can do some stuff around this to support families but we have to focus on what's in our gift and what's in our influence. Good relationships with families working together towards a common goal, but focusing the thing that we have the biggest influence over is the quality of teaching and learning in our classrooms. Uh, and then there's a super research uh, study around attendance, uh, persistence, absence and inclusion from the British Psychological Society. They have a, some brilliant um, post-COVID resources too for schools. So I'd really commend that to you. And then there's some do's and don'ts uh, around impact evaluation. Um, impact evaluation is fundamental to an effective disadvantage uh, strategy, but what's important is that we decouple it from accountability. So we're not trying to prove what we're doing has been successful, we're trying to find out whether it's been successful and in what circumstances and high quality uh, impact evaluation you know, is, is, is fundamental to better outcomes for disadvantaged pupils. And the one to really be wary of is in the don'ts, the third from the bottom. So be really wary of using vague outcome measures from the start, because this just makes it easy to claim success, but we're not necessarily seeing better outcomes for pupils. Uh, I'm going to stop now, but just re really brief it some you know, comments around, you know, the language that we use, you know, in our disadvantaged strategies. Uh, on, on, on schools' websites, and I think the importance of framing things in the positive and holding our disadvantaged families in high regard. If we change that language and frame it in the positive, it just becomes invigorating and energising, and these are things that we want to do for all pupils, aren't we? Rather than poor speaking and listening skills, to talking about development and speaking and listening skills, something that we want to do for all pupils, not just those with a pupil premium label. If you haven't heard enough, done a number of area-based studies on this uh, that you can access you know, from you know, right across the country, um, looking at, uh, you know, again, what are the critical elements of an effective disadvantage strategy?